<laughs> I'm Lynn Videcka. I'm the Dean of the Silver School of Social Work, and it's a special honor and privilege to welcome you to the 2014 Black History Month lecture for the Silver School of Social Work. In 2000, well, it was a process that took place over a number of years. Between 2010 and 2012, uh, the faculty and students and staff of the school engaged in a strategic planning process. And one of the four strategic goals uh, that was the result of, the, of that process was to rededicate the Silver School of Social Work to social justice and to diversity, and rededicate in every sense of the word, through curriculum, through our community, through the composition of our community, through our extracurricular activities, such as this evening's event. One of the action steps, um, for those of you familiar with the strategic planning lo uh, lingo, um, is to, one of the action steps in, in under that strategic goal was to create a diversity committee. Uh, this is a committee of students, faculty, and staff. Uh, and the idea is to uh, really institutionalize our commitment to social justice and diversity. We needed to have a structure within our community to um, make sure that we were always monitoring ourselves, thinking toward the future, creating and innovating. And now I'm getting to the punchline here. Um, I'm giving, uh, I want to give a big thank you and the credit for this evening's um, wonderful event featuring Dr. Sadie Logan, whom you will meet in a moment. I want to give all the credit to um, uh, creating the event, working with my office and with Courtney O'Mealy's office to implement the event to the 2013-14 uh, Silver School of Social Work, Social Justice and Diversity Committee. And so I'm going to introduce the members and they are uh, Robin Miller, Robin Miller, who is uh, faculty member Robin Miller, who is chair of the committee. Other faculty members on the committee, Gina Nastas, Diane Grabney, Robert Hawkins, and Tazuko Shibusawa, a familiar cast of characters to many of you I know, the leaders, leaders in many ways at the school. Our staff member, Bruce Duvall. Um, uh, students on the committee, Melissa Bowman, Maduri Ja, uh, Rhiannon Malden, Amanda Mays, and Christina Ramirez. I know a few of you are here. <laughs> Up with those hands. Wonderful. I also want to thank two students who volunteered, um, got hooked. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what the process was, but we're really fortunate to have two student um, reactors to this evening to Dr. Logan's uh, talk. And those are Amanda Mays and Margaret Wood. So thank you. And we look forward to a wonderful presentation and to a wonderful discussion after the presentation. So Dr. Robert Hawkins is going to introduce uh, Dr. Sadie Logan now. Good afternoon. I, I have the uh, honor to introduce Dr. Logan, uh, who I met at um, University of South Carolina when I was giving a talk down there a couple of years ago, and uh, it's been a real honor to, to, to know her, and I'm very happy you're here. Dr. Logan is a is the Distinguished Professor Emerita at the University of South Carolina College of Social Work. Uh, she was the, the former I.D. Quincy Newman Chair, Chair Professor in the College of Social Work and served as the founder and director of the Isaiah De Quincy Newman Institute for Peace and Social Justice from 2001 to the fall of uh, 2013. She joined the College of Social Work after serving on the faculty at the University of Kansas School of Social Welfare for 15 years. In, uh, she was uh, a 2011 recipient of the National Association of Social Workers uh, Pioneer Award and is the recipient of the 2013 Council on Social Work Education Women Council Feminist Scholar Award. Dr. Logan earned her MSW here in New York City from Hunter and her Doctorate of Social Work, also here in New York City, from Columbia University. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dr. Logan, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk.
Good evening, everyone. I would like to first begin by thanking Dr. Hawkins for his very thoughtful introduction, his very kind introduction. And then I would like to thank everyone who had a part in making my coming here feeling so warm and welcoming. Starting with the dean and her assistant, her executive assistant, and the members of the diversity committee. So I felt very taken care of. And I want to extend my appreciation to all of you for being here this evening. I knew it was a choice, and so I'm delighted uh, to see you here. And I'm very delighted and honored to be a part of your acknowledgement of the contribution and presence of African Americans in terms of the contribution that they have made to the development of our country. Thinking about or uh, uh, reflecting on what I would be speaking to you about this evening, I thought that I would spend my time talking about a subject that has been and continue to be an integral part of my professional journey, my personal and professional journey. And that is the African American family. <coughs> you know, as I thought about what I wanted the focus of this talk to be, at least two things came to mind. And one was that I didn't want it to be a rehash of old information. I didn't want you to say, then they haven't done that. And two, I didn't want it to be a litany of statistics about the deplorable conditions under which many African American families continue to exist in this country and in this society. But I also wanted to be clear that I'm not suggesting that these two things are not important, because they are. I simply came this evening with a different purpose. It is my intention in this talk to focus upon the work that I've done and my life experiences in order to propose what I'm describing as a paradigm shift in the way that we understand strengths within ourselves as well as within black families. Because I think we always have to start with ourselves. I will propose ways of not only defining and capturing inner strengths within black families and ourselves, but also ways to understand and utilize these strengths. My thinking about the human family, as well as African American families, has been informed by the research of genetics and anthropology. I've been influenced by the research of people like Spencer Wells and the writing of Steve Olson, as well as my own 30 years as a practitioner of yoga and meditation. And so I would like to 
to begin this talk with a short story. And this story is about a young Gullah girl and her great-grandmother who grew up on a Carolina sea island off the coast of Charleston. The great-grandmother was born in slavery shortly before Emancipation Proclamation. Her parents and her ancestors were enslaved Africans who lived on the sea island for two centuries. They were virtually isolated and cut off from the mainland. These enslaved Africans preserved a great deal of their cultural heritage, reflecting both on the continuity with Africa and creativity in living in a new, alien, and hostile environment. The young girl loved her great-grandmother very much. And as often as she could, she would come and sit on her great-grandmother's lap and say to her, <coughs> Great-grandmother, tell me once again about our family's history so that I will never forget who I am and where I came from. <coughs> great-grandmother, who never tired of telling her about the family history, would always begin with the truth. This tree that was there when the enslaved African came, and it was there when the Africans were emancipated, and it is still there. Great grandmother would say, My dearest one, I want you to hold the image of that magnificent live oak tree down the road from here in your awareness always as a symbol of our enslaved African family, as well as a symbol of our ancient African family. This tree you see represents their hope, their courage, their resilience, their inner and outer strengths as well as they continue to through time and space. At this point, with a very far away look in her eyes, great-grandmother continued by saying, this island with its pastoral and mysterious landscapes whole many memories. I can remember how our African forebearers spent their days fishing, planting, shrimping, crabbing, quilting, weeding, reaping, and preserving the harvest. I can also remember the visible reflections of Africa in our speech, hairstyles, our arts and crafts, and in some of our everyday habits and behaviors. Of equal importance, dear one, are my memories of this island's unsung heroes and sheroes. For example, 
Mr. Esau Jenkins, and his co-worker, Ms. Septima Poinsettia Clark. They were crusaders of our civil and human rights, and above all, our right to vote and to a decent education. But even more important, day one, I want you to remember your ancient African family. Because it is so easy to forget. And some people do not believe that we are all part of a much larger family. You see, you are not just an individual whose enslaved ancestors lived on this Carolina Sea Island for more than two centuries. You are a part of a very amazing history that is yet to be told. You, my day one, as well as all of the people on this planet, came from one woman approximately 150,000 years ago. This woman lived in a family group of about 25 people. They roamed the hot savanna region of Africa in search of food. It was the search for food and not slavery that moved them out of Africa and into different parts of the world. Scientists will say one day that she may be thought of and of yours and everyone else's 10,000th great-grandmother. The faraway look again returned to her eyes and she continued saying, as black people in this country, much has happened to our emotional, physical, and spiritual selves. Although we have made significant progress as a people, there is still a tremendous amount of work to be done. And a major part of this work, day one, involves remembering. Remembering what we have so long ago forgotten about who we are. I'm so pleased to know, <coughs> however, that this gap between where we have been, where we are going, and where we need to go will be addressed in all arenas of our lives. My dear one, addressing this gap will also be a huge part of the current and future work of yours and others. Others who believe in a just and equitable society. Building on this theme of remembering, I have chosen to use the concept of reclaiming the inner strength to address the gap between the significant progress that we have made as a people and the tremendous amount of work that remains to be done. I use this theme because it captures what I believe is missing in our lives as a people and is necessary and required to fully realize our potential as a people. <coughs> this 
reclamation is concerned with something intrinsic and at the core of the existence of all humans. It also addresses what may be described as a spiritual crisis in our lives as well as in our society. This inner strength of which I speak has been described as an inherent gift, something that we're all born with. An internationally recognized spiritual teacher described it this way. Inner strength is a divine gift. It holds everything in place, inside and outside. It allows both change and the unchanging to take place, depending on the circumstances it allows you to give in or to hold back. Flexibility and rigidity <coughs> are well timed when you rely on your inherent inner strength. This strength, he says, isn't built with the power of clever words, nor does it come from the support of others. It doesn't depend on a nurturing upbringing nor does it lean on your accomplishments. Many spiritual traditions identify loss of the inner strength as one of the major causes of physical and mental illness. Loss of our inner strength involves feelings of identity confusion and disorientations. In this process, one feels as though a crucial part of oneself has been lost. The feeling is sometimes described as depression or many other terms that we would find in the social work literature or in literature in general in its attempt to capture the state of being. It is believed that this inner strength is weakened or lost due to disharmony within oneself and between oneself and the universe. This imbalance or disharmony between the internal world and the external world leads to confusion in how we live our lives. Most often, loss of our inner strength occurs because of some trauma that shocks the strength. I started to say out of our body, but I believe it's in remission because it's not loss. For black people on this continent, on this planet, the trauma was our over 200 years of enslavement and its aftermath. I remember reading in a Newsweek article in 1997 by Jonathan Otla, an article entitled, The Long Shadow of Slavery. And Otla wrote that for nations like people, distant memory of trauma can be submerged or repressed but never extinguished. The trauma for blacks in this country may also be viewed as a cutoff from the homeland, from the ancestors, and a break from sacred traditions. Dr. Melodoma Patrice Somme a West African scholar says that a spiritual crisis which results from a loss of our inner strength 
can start as early as birth. For example, when instead of being welcomed into his, her, by his or her people, a child comes into the world and is greeted by a world of technology and program behaviors. If any of you parents, you know what that's like. There isn't an entire welcoming community. As a result, Dr. Somme believes that children grow up confused about their purpose in life <coughs> and moves into adolescence with an attitude of impetuousness and insubordination. He believes that such behavior is directly linked to the need for love and a feeling of being included. He also believed that rights of initiation is missing. And these rights, according to Dr. Sumi, are aimed at including the young person in the community and recognizing their genius and moving them toward maturity and adult responsibility. And Dr. Sumi's West African culture the children from birth to puberty is the responsibility of the village. Hence, the saying that it takes a whole village to raise a child, because this is, this is true in West African culture. It is the collective attention and care that prepares the child for his or her gift potential of skills, for achieving his or her life's purpose. As African Americans, especially on the Carolina or other sea islands along the eastern seashore, we somehow maintain for centuries this ancient way of binding our communities and our families in a close relationship with the sacred. It wasn't until approximately three decades after the Emancipation Proclamation, around 1895, that we began to forget who we were. And we started reading in the literature about the disintegration of African American families, the dissolution of African American families, the disruption of African American families the dysfunction of African-American families. And when I thought about this, I said, we were certainly dissing African-American families. And we continue to do so. A, a 1933 quote from a well-known African-American educator, Carter G. Woodson, shed some light on this process of forgetting. Carter said, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his action. When you determine what a man shall think, you don't have to concern yourself about what he will do. If you make a man feel he is inferior, you don't have to compel him to accept inferior status, for he will seek it himself. Although it is critical that we understand the process and the impact of loss of the inner strength, it is equally important to emphasize that this theme is not intended to ignore the strengths that are inherent in our culture and heritage. The intent is to help begin 
the daunting task of remembering the inherent strength within us and then to move forward. There are many positive signs that suggest that a recovery of our inner strength is possible and underway. But additional signs suggest, as indicated earlier, that a great deal of work remains to be done in our individual and collective recovery process. I believe, however, that for us to continue to build on and harness the enormous resources of our people, we must relearn how to tap into our inner strengths and continually nurture its growth and development. Here's where the paradigm shift comes into play. To do what is required, we must cultivate a new or an expanded mindset. As helping professionals and educators, we must work to create hope, not only within ourselves, but also within those that we are fortunate enough to be working with. I will not conclude this talk by sharing with you five simple but powerful strategies that I believe to be significant in reconnecting with our inner strength. I like to think of these strategies as second level strategies. And the first strategy is externalizing our problems and concerns. And I know that this is not new to you because some researchers, practitioners, and educators utilize this strategy as a part of the practice and as a part of the teaching paradigm. We may use this strategy as well as the other four strategies to help our clients as well as ourselves. The emphasis in this strategy is on helping families to separate themselves from the attitude and beliefs, from the problems or stresses in their lives. Oftentimes families think that they are the problems. And this is viewed as helping families to move out of the world of problems and into the world of experience, new possibilities, and new opportunities. Now to illustrate, let's say you have an overwhelmed grandmother in her early 60s who is caring for three grandchildren, an impetuous adolescent granddaughter, a pre-adolescent grandson, around age 12, and a two and a half year old granddaughter. The 12 year old grandson is viewed by the community and the school as a family problem. He has been held back once in school and appears to be failing again. His teachers are fed up with what they call his mouthy attitude and clownish horseplay. The children's mother is a crack addict and the father is in jail for drug dealing. <coughs> in her drug addicted state, the mother was abusive and neglectful of her children. And hence, their emplacement with the grandmother. Now, I do not wish to oversimplify this complex situation, but the most obvious task is to help this grandmother with four major activities. The first is to see 
how crack has impacted the lives of the entire family. Two, to see her grandson, not as a candidate for the juvenile justice system, but as a child in need of love, care, safety, and protection. And three, to see how societal influence and the children's parent lifestyle have precipitated the children's parent involvement in drug use. And four, to identify at least one time or a situation when the grandmother experienced her grandson as a gift, a divine being, not as a problem child or a bad boy. So in addition to creating hope in families like this through externalizing the concerns of searching for exceptions, this second strategy is essential. And this second strategy is what I call seven healing saying. Our job or our goal is to help families find ways to connect with these feelings and thoughts as well as to become comfortable in saying them and accepting them as a part of who they are. The first healing saying is, I am love or I love you. The second is I'm grateful or thank you. The third is I care or I'm sorry. The fourth is I do not know or I need help. The fifth is I expect more or that's not good enough. The sixth is Everything happens for the best, or nothing happens by chance. The seventh is, I have had enough and will not take any more. Or no, stop, enough. These seven healing expressions are intended to help families and individuals determine as well as to nurture the fullness of the emotional and spiritual lives. In other words, they are also useful in supporting as well as checking one's level of centeredness or balance within families as well as it's within ourselves. Families are instructed, for example, to ask themselves to honestly answer these questions about the healing expression. I believe I have them. The first question is, which of the seven messages are easiest to say? I'm also suggesting that we ask ourselves these questions too. Which of the seven messages are the most frequently used in your home? Which of the seven messages are most difficult to say to a family member? Which of the seven messages are never said in your family? And fifth, does the message pattern remain <clears throat> the same or constant regardless of who you're with? If you're with family, is it easy to say them or ask them? If you're with co-workers or friends? Although these healing expressions appear to be quite simplistic, it is important to note that each one of these healing sayings express feelings or a state that fosters strength, empowerment, and inner transformation. 
absence of any one denotes a degree of spiritual starvation or dryness of the heart. Together, these seven strengths-based expression creates a foundation for continued growth and healing in families and in ourselves. The third strategy involves teaching families to respond and not react to life circumstances. For example, it is important to help the grandmother who was described in the previous case illustration, to practice listening more to her grandchildren, to talk less, and to search for alternative responses to yelling, or to uh, the use of some punitive disciplinary measures. This strategy teaches families that they have some choice about how events unfold in their lives. The fifth and final strategy teaches family to restore their lives by changing those aspects of their current life scripts that are not working. Again, for this grandmother and her grandchildren, the story of the restoring begins with the recognition that the children's natural parents are sick and may not be able to assume care and responsibility for them for a long time to come, if ever. The life circumstances of the parents need to be placed in perspective, and the children and grandmother affirmed for what is working in their lives and for possibilities of things to come. This affirmation allows inner strength and inner healing to occur. This last strategy deals with the issue concerning transitioning and new adjustments. Here families are cautioned that change takes time, but that the change process or healing is under their control, and that the source of the healing power or the inner strength rests within them. This is something the families need to hear more often from everyone, especially from those who are in the helping role. I would like to conclude this talk with a quote from Marianne Williamson, a quote that was often attributed to the great leader, Nelson Mandela. And it is that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measures. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And this presence of which Williamson speaks is permeated by our inner strengths. And I'm convinced that this is the vision of the future of all families, but especially of African American families and children, as they begin to remember. Thank you. So thank you for that thought-provoking and very meaningful presentation. It's something that I don't think we hear enough of, so thank you very much for bringing it to us. Um, I'd like to introduce now your discussants, uh, two students. Let's see, they have a bio. Um, I think you can sit, do you want to sit with the students? You have a choice, you can sit with the students or... <laughs> So uh, our first student discussant is uh, Amanda Mays. She's a first year MSW student and an intern at the Children's Storefront, an independent school in 
in East Harlem serving African American families living at or below the poverty level. Um, prior to NYU, um, Amanda worked in advocacy and policy development in, pub in, a public, in the public interest arena. Um, and so Amanda will take a seat here with Margaret Woods. And Margaret is a second year extended MSW student and, and alumna of, of NYU Stern. She is currently interning at the Big Six Tower, a, natural, a naturally occurring retirement community uh, program in Woodside, Queens. Margaret is, a, is the GSW secretary for 2013-2014 academic year and a student leader in the Gerontology Student Collective and an active participant on Facebook. <laughs> and so... And Margaret, I have to add, Margaret's doing a brilliant, uh, I didn't know about it, so I ran upstairs to check this out. She's doing a, a brilliant, um, ongoing, um, I guess, biography of African American leaders during African, during, um, African American History Month. So that's been a, a lot of fun to read. And so now I'm going to spend more time on Facebook. I have a reason to spend more time. So... <laughs> So I was thinking about what to say last night and uh, how appreciative I've been for this opportunity to work with these kids. And, but I want to first take a step back because as Dr. Logan says, it starts with us. And part of what inspired me to come to school and to do this work is my own experience as an international adoptee and a subsequent resident of the foster care system and not having what I thought was the typical family experience. And at many times, reading a lot of things, I'm thinking, there's something wrong with me because there's not enough wrong with me. Because <laughs> everything I read about somebody in my situation sounded so depressing. The outcomes were so staggering. And I didn't, it was really um, complicated for me to try to understand myself as an adjusted healthy human being when there was so much information that told me I should be the contrary. And I extend, some, I extend that experience in my work with my kids now uh, at the school. I call them my kids. Termination is looming and I'm having boundary <laughs> issues. You'll excuse me. Um, but I also I wanted to share a story because I thought this was very powerful. And growing up in my experience, I wanted to be African American. To me, it felt like there was so much more narrative out there of a larger community that came together to raise a child when the biological parents weren't available. And that's something that I wish I had had in the small Oregon town that I grew up in. And as I, um, a teacher, a second grade teacher came to me and said that a child in their class had experienced a death in their family recently and wanted me to just do a touch base with this child. And I speak about death a lot with these kids. This is a really common experience with them. So I brought them in and started doing some artwork and I tried to approach it. How are things going? How is the weekend? No detail. We didn't have any details. And he stopped me and he piped up and he said, do you know about the honey badger? And I said, I don't. So he started to regale me with the details of the honey badger, and there are a lot of fun facts about the honey badger. So he, he continued to just really, in an animated way, tell me all about this, his favorite animal. And then he took a pause for a moment and said, and I think a lot of people don't know this, but the honey badger has a lot of relatives. There's the skunks and the ferrets and the weasel. Did I say that this was an eight-year-old boy? So many many in the community of this honey badger. And I left that session thinking, oh, I hadn't assessed ego strengths, defenses. <laughs> I didn't know who died. I didn't know how close they were to him. I didn't know what um, discussion had happened with him. I didn't know how really all those things that I've been trained to think about when working with kids. But what I did know what he was telling me when I stopped asking questions was how strong his community was, how safe he felt in his family, how great 
his experience was in this community. And I felt comforted by that. Because so many times in this work, the best that we can do is to just be present for other people's suffering. And, and I think because of that, we forget that it's such a deep honor that along with what Dr. Logan said is remembering the history is to bear witness to its fruition. That this child, through that hundreds of years of legacy, was able to tell me in this time that normally would be so disorienting a death in the family that he had very strong and cohesive community. And that, to me, is a deep privilege that I think we as social workers in the helping profession need to remember, that bearing witness is a very powerful tool, both for the, the people we work with, but really for ourselves. Because it was in that moment I realized I'm part of the African-American community. My childhood goal was because i have been invited into this little guy's life. Wow, she touched on so many things I wanted to discuss. But um, the idea of remembering, um, I, I was thinking about my family. And um, when Dr. Logan mentioned a lot of who we are has to do with remembering, um, I came to go and live with my grandmother and my great-grandmother. So I appreciate how you started out the story with the oral history and how the grandmother was telling the granddaughter because a lot of that mirrored what I experienced growing up and how oral history was so important for the family because a lot of it wasn't written down. My great-grandmother was born in 1896 and my grandmother was born had she lived, she would have been 100 this year, so she was born in 1914. So a lot of the history was um, told over and over again. And... Um, just remembering how I came to live with her, my mother and my father, they had lost two children before me. And I guess a lot of the trauma of that and the fear of not being able to have, they thought maybe they couldn't have children anymore, and then me coming along, and then this need to protect and to nurture and to, by all means necessary, you know, um, protect this, this baby, this infant. And the hard choice that my mom made to send me south. And um, I was doing a genogram for um, a class, um, practice class, and we had to sit down and talk about family history. And um, a lot of my family, I, we just recently had death in the family, so a lot of my family was um, gathering from North Carolina and New York. And I was just looking around the room, and I realized that a lot of my family is aging. And um, just what that meant, and the history, and how who will carry that on? And so I'm kind of taking up the charge of finding out the details and keeping it alive, um, not just for myself, but for my children. And just being able to keep the continuity going, that's a, that's, um, a concern of mine. Because, you know, as time goes on, People forget, and teenagers, they are, oh, Mom, I don't want to hear that. You know, but this is your family. This is who you are, and to keep those stories alive because this is what connects you to a larger family, to a larger body, and I want to be able to give that to my two children. So I'm here at the funeral, and I'm thinking, and I'm looking around the room, and I'm saying, wow, you know, I've always had that, the intergenerational uh, experience. My grandmother, my great grandmother, were um, they influenced me and they helped raise me. And my kids were fortunate enough to have her around before she passed. So a lot of that I see is kind of fading away. And um, I work with older adults out in Queens, and I go in and I do home visits. And a lot of the times, it's just talking, you know, they want so much to have someone present and to listen to their stories. And I'm currently, my Pops Project is currently a video memoir, so I'm trying to get some stories down, just to allow them to talk about their history. And um, just in the simplest little comments, you know, you can tell a story or you'll, you'll mention a date 
and they'll say, oh, I remember what I did. I remember going to this concert because we're doing like icebreakers in a group that I co-facilitate and we're doing like, we'll, what's name that tune? And we'll um, just say the lyrics to the song and they have to tell us the, um, the singer and the name of the song. And all of the stories that come out as a result once they, oh, that was um, Nat King Cole or that was, that was um, you know, whoever it might, Frank Sinatra. Oh, I remember going to this, um, this, this theater and we saw him and all the women were screaming and they just go into all of these stories. But it's all about remembering and, all, and those things that keep them alive and keep them happy. And so a lot of that, I'm very excited about that, being able to be a part of that because they welcome me into their memories, into their lives. And that just, it, it makes me happy. It makes me hopeful, you know, just to be able to stimulate those thoughts. And um, because as they're aging, they're losing that. So just the whole idea of remembering, that's so important. And being a social worker who desires to work with older adults, um, I want to be able to continue to bring that, be that person, you know, that you can tell the story to and be present for them and appreciate you know, appreciate your life and appreciate what you've gone through. Because a lot of times between the generations, sometimes that gets lost. The younger people in the family, they don't take the time to listen to the stories. But those stories are actually what brought you to where you are now. So um, I really thank you for that because it's um, a lot of this is stirring up a lot of things that I would like to do within my own family and being a parent. <coughs> and then also my work as a social worker, just being there and really appreciating the lives and experiences that older adults have. So thank you. So now we'd like to invite Dr. Logan back up and take some questions from the audience. Or comments. <laughs> Other comments that you might have that you would like to share? Any? Okay, you're a volunteer. Um, as I was listening to the two of you, uh, I was uh, moved by uh, the depth of your trust of your own experience because that's what you bring in the door when you're a student. You can't know what you haven't learned yet. And so you can't be anxious about what you don't know because you haven't learned it yet, so why do that? And that brought me back to the very last line that you had in your PowerPoint, because I think that's all we bring through the door as practitioners is our own uh, mind life or inner freedom or something. That's what people respond to. And then we build theories around that when we're anxious about not having that, uh, because that's where connection grows and that's where technique grows uh, from one point. But I wanted to. What I was thinking about when you were speaking was my partner, if I may. <laughs> uh, Maggie's from Cameroon. And uh, I haven't been there, but she's brought that to me. And what I see, I've only seen once before, so I'll tell two stories. Story number one, when I was living in North Carolina, somebody knocked on my door at 12 at night in my apartment complex. And I opened the door, and it looked like two African people. My feeling is that you hold your face differently depending on where you come from. Both African people. So come in. Uh, so Bruno and Evie tell me that they've locked themselves out of their apartment, and they don't know what to do. And I said, well, you could sleep on my floor. And then they figured out, actually, they have an uncle a couple of towns over. But that offer made me family. So... They invited me over. We had to say a prayer before I went past their threshold because going into somebody's house is a big deal. So you have to consecrate the event. And then when I stepped over the threshold, I became his brother, uh, which he subsequently explained to me. I don't know if I would have bought this if he told me ahead of time. Uh, but that meant that I had to tell him if I thought he was living his life wrong. And if I didn't think he was treating Evie right, I should tell him. And if I thought he was making bad decisions, I should tell him. And if he needed advice, I had to say, what do you want to know? Uh, and he, he, he 
pulled that from me a number of times. I asked him, before colonialism, what do you think, he was from Congo, what do you think might have been there before the Europeans came that the colonialists took advantage of that turned into what we have now? And Bruno said, if I get a job and my brother sees me get a job, he says, that's really good. And if I get a job and my neighbor, who's not my brother, sees it, he says, why did he get it? Parenthesis, why didn't I get it? He must have done something dishonest. He doesn't deserve it. I said, well, that's, that's very profound in terms of you're connected and it's good, as you were saying, or you're not connected and it's bad. The thing we see about village life, uh, Maggie is everybody's auntie. So I don't have to call her Auntie Maggie, but everybody else automatically does. And what I see is there's kind of three spheres of life. One is you're an auntie or you're an uncle or you're a grandparent or a grandmother or grandfather. And that means you have experience and you know something. And people want to trust that so that they can live their lives better. So group number one is the aunties and the uncles. Group number two is people who want to be near the aunties and uncles so they can learn what the aunties and uncles know so that when they're older they can do it too. And group number three are the people who don't want to do that, but they want people to give them things. And so they cluster around people who like to take responsibility to take advantage of that for as long as they can. And that seems very old in terms of a, a social structure. So with children, the children cluster around the aunties and the uncles in the second generation and the fifth generation. And you do have a whole village raising a child, except when you come here and you have a nuclear family and all that's gone. So those are kind of random thoughts that pass through my mind when the three of you were talking and I'm very grateful for your presentations. It's so uh, I thought that she, you know, when we were talking about the healing words, that you know, we laid out these very core fundamental principles that families can use that I thought were you know, very powerful and, and very strong. And, um, and then I, I started thinking uh, these principles have to get translated into uh, more practical, everyday actions and thoughts and reactions. And I can see how these principles would cut across generations and situations and things like that. But I started wondering, well, how would these things manifest themselves uh, on the part, say, of a parent uh, for a six-year-old versus a 12-year-old versus an 18-year-old versus a 24-year-old? Approaching and trying to use these principles uh, in life, or would they, would they be uh, enacted or operationalized differently for boys as opposed to girls? Uh, or, um, so I'm just wondering uh, your thoughts about the uh, moving from the general principle to the specifics of everyday life and interactions and how that might need to change as a function of individual differences and s stages and things like that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, as the students were getting their reflection, the thought that came to me was how important narratives are. Because it's about what families, it's about how we talk with families and how we ask questions. And, and in that process, we help families to, because if, if, if we start discussing with the family, talk with the family about how do you express caring? How do you, how, are you able to say to a child that you love them? Are you able to show a child that you love them? It's through our, it's through our interactive process with the family that we're able to help them to make that connection. And I don't think that it makes a difference at what age the child is, if you're able to say, 
you love them or you care for them or you are able to show them through your action how you feel toward them. Do you have do you have a different thought about it? No, I I just think that there's a like I said the, the, the way I mean I, I I fundamentally embrace the principles that you're talking about, and for example, expressing caring and love and, and things like that. I'm just thinking that maybe the way you go about. Uh, Expressing that in everyday life may you know, differ as your uh, child is in different stages of development, so to speak. It's, it, it doesn't mean that you should, again, it's a principle that's important to always do, but um, I can see how different life circumstances might produce different ways of expressing it, different ways of saying it that might be more effective for younger children as opposed to older children or something like that. It, it would seem that for all children you need affirmation. Yeah. And it depends on what the interaction is or what the situation is between the parents. But I think you have to start with the parent to help the parent, to see where the parent is in, in this, doing an assessment with the parent around these issues. And then you could help the parent, depending on a situation arises, how to deal with those situations. And I think over time, parents begin to learn a different way of interacting with their children, depend, doesn't, depending on what level of development they are. But they have to have this specific situation to help in that process. Um, did you want to say something, Tom? Um, I, no, I was actually thinking about that, that same issue, and I think part of uh, that is, I mean, certainly a lot of it is developmental, but there's a part that I think is that, that, that is very cultural as well, and almost almost situational. Where, and, and I think about it um, not as much around nurturing and and from that angle, but also from when do you introduce. Uh, for African American families, for example, when do you introduce the idea of, of racism? And so, and at, you know, some people would argue that we try to hold off for as long as they can and make a very good developmental argument. And other people, sort of right out of the gate, really talk about it. And and and, and you know, and I have my own feelings about when would be appropriate, but but I think. There's that calculation that families make. Some of that's just based on tradition. Some of it's cultural, and and, and I think nurturing and all of this is can be related to that. At least that's what that's what triggered in my mind. So it's thinking about when you introduce some of these more complex ideas. I think I I recalled. Um, Growing up, and uh, with, with, my, with my daughter in, in, in Kansas, um, I found that it was very trying to help to balance for her the difference between connecting and and not hate. Whenever she encounters a situation that was difficult or uh, that has some issues in it that suggested that race was a factor. So as a parent, it's almost imperative that you work to try to balance that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation. And I don't see that it's necessarily relating to those principles um, of, of healing expressions that I just shared. But I think that those expressions are utilized depending on the situation that a family is experiencing at a given moment. And it's really internal to the family in terms of how they interact with one another, because I think that's where it has to start first. And it doesn't matter to, as, if the child is uh, six years old or 10 years old or an adolescent, to be able to teach those expression and to utilize those expression in interaction with them.
Yes. I, I appreciate your uh, appreciate your share. Um, it's interesting when we when we get around this time of month and we talk about uh, African history, and it's, it's sometimes for me it feels, as you said in the beginning, it, it kind of has a cliche to it. it kind of goes a certain kind of way, and I appreciate your ability to make, I guess, the African story, the human story. And I feel that the indigenous peoples around the world, what's happened a lot is that they're dislocated because they're seen as less than, not a part of something. And I think a part of Success for African people, people who have been disenfranchised, is remembering the story. It's having storytellers tell that story over and over again. That's what the grandmother provided mm -hmm. for that daughter. And along the way, the resiliency to have to, as you were saying before about, you know, whatever the issue is racism or raising your children or remembering certain things, and this is how we remember things to keep your psyche. You know, I was listening to you, you, you you're a yoga practitioner, so that's, that's spirituality. You know, so, and when we look at Eastern philosophy, or we look at um, African families, we are very religious, so are spiritual people. You know, religion is a whole other bag of stuff, but that keeps you intact in terms of what you have to do with in the society and being constantly in sale. So there's, I think, not to put everybody in a bucket, but I think in terms of the trauma that African people have experienced and continue to experience, where we're able to kind of have a link to our story, where we're able to, to, to link to each other's humanity despite our differences. And when the broader society <clears throat> sees us as a part of them, because you are a part of us, because when you talked about the first mother, I mean, we're all the same people. We just got separated at some point. We forgot. We didn't wake up all. You know? But that's you know that's 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 the big human story. Where we, where, who am I? Where did we come from? And so I, I appreciate your story. And I appreciate you. You know, being able to tap into. You know what what can we do to sustain that? Having a sense of self, coming up with some practices to get grounded in. In spite of the chaos that we face. Thank you. Yes, I, um, I, I was, you know, as I was reflecting on your talk, I think you, um, you made some quotes at the beginning that I found very moving uh, or, or about if you want to control a person's actions control their mind and the whole um, to me that really e evoked a sense of oppressive forces and so on as they are internalized in people's own behavior and so so on and so I would love to hear your thinking about um, the um, experiences of oppression the internalization of, of them whether it's historical or and or in one's own experience, and the capacity to um, to enact these five, I think of your list was five um, <coughs> healing, um, uh, transformative family healing messages. <coughs> and I, I wonder if you can speak to that. And, I, and of course, I'm thinking of things like, um, are the are the abilities to communicate these important messages and take these important actions affected? Of course, they must be affected by one's own experiences and internalization of oppression. How you work with families to um, move forward, rise above, work through whatever you think needs to be done in order to position 
And I'm, Jim was asking about the children. I'm sort of thinking about the parents in order to um, position the parent or grandparent, whoever the caregiver is, to really be um, to really be as generative and caring and healing and fruitful as possible with their with their family. You know, I hope I didn't suggest that this was going to be easy. <laughs> and, and also. It's one of the reasons why I kept bringing it back to ourselves as well as the families because if we are not connected with who we are and if we are connected with with hope, with unconditional love, with uh, non-judgmental behaviors, we can't do anything with these families. And that's why I thought we have to do our work mm -hmm before we can begin to tackle what I said was an, a daunting task. Because I'm not speaking about families that already have it together. And they're at a place where I am at, probably been meditating for 30 years. So they're starting at a very different place. And therefore, you know, when, when um, and I'm very Amanda. sorry. Uh, what's your name, please? Margaret. Margaret. Mm -hmm. Margaret. When Margaret was talking about remembering, I was sitting there thinking, this remembering is on so many different levels. Because I was talking about it at a very deep level. But it has to start someplace. And I thought, at that level, that's healing too. But if you can think about a person that was in the place that Carter was talking about, and if you recall, I said in 1895 was when African Americans stopped forgetting. Mm -hmm. You know, families were, were discussed and described as really up, outwardly mobile. Uh, but after Reconstruction, I think that was like the last straw. And I really, I really examined that when people like Billingsley and others spoke about the strength of black families. Then at some point they started talking about <coughs> families not having those strengths. And I said, well, what happened? What happened to their strengths? And so, so I pinpoint a time and place. And so when we're talking about centuries of oppression and oppression and repression that we're still experiencing today, we have to take small steps. But what I am saying is that as helpers, it has to begin with us. We have to come from, come from that unconditional place, that place of, of non-judgment. And it's through our modeling that we will help those families to evolve. Because I, I'm giving you a framework, a perspective. And then you, you use that as your guide as you move in your arena of helping families to reconnect to what I'm defining as the inner strength. Because I'm talking about a spiritual strength, a spiritual awareness. And so the first order of change would be to do an assessment, a spiritual assessment of families. And then it's going to take a lot of work. We can't keep dissing them, uh, dissing families, that bulk of families that are considered the throwaways in our society. I'm talking African-American families, the one that people refer to as the underclass or the working poor. So that's my response. <laughs> yes? I just want to add that you know, everything is based on the core values that the families have. And then if you're able to assess that, then everything else can be built onto that. And the five strategies that you outlined, you know, the, the, if you look at the family and understand the core values that they have within that family structure, and then you could use some of that to mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. explore and expand the work on that. Mm -hmm. and then I wanted to just touch on racism. I work with, at the domestic violence shelter and I run in the to the families, and I usually just put it out there. 
versus uh, Black History Month. How is everybody can, you know, how do you talk to your children about what Black History is all about? How do you understand it? And then we talk about the oppression and all of that. So, you know, if you're able to kind of just talk about mm -hmm. put it out there. And in that group, I have people from multiracial backgrounds. So it's not just about, you know, a black and white thing. It's about women, you know, because it's a women's shot. What, what are you experiencing as a woman with children and in this situation? What is it for you like when you're celebrating the black history? What is your understanding of it? How do you explain it to your children? So just putting it out there and just, you know, they have a lot of discussions and they have, you know, they will be willing to work with. I would call that first order, a first order strategy. And I think it's the same with when we're trying to connect with where families are in terms of how they use these healing expressions. We have to start with what gives life meaning. Mm -hmm. where, where are they in all of this? I mean, to do that assessment before we even begin to, to suggest the strategies. So it looks like we might have time for one more well, short here, question. Here's one, short one over answer. here. It's actually a comment. Um, I guess listening to um, your presentation and hearing the students, a doctoral student who was a, was a uh, practitioner for many years and now looking into her research, and one of the things that I see myself as being a researcher as being important is looking at the strengths, because there's so much written about the deficits or mm -hmm. whatever you other attitudes you want to use about black families, in particular black fathers, that is kind of fueling this this very negative connotation about the black family. So where I see myself in terms of remembering and bringing up the inner strength is looking at, because they are black fathers, Latino fathers who are involved in a nurturing and responsible way for their children. And we want to see what are those mechanisms that's helping those families and making it work that we can help those other families who are at a very different level. And it's not that individuals innately don't want to be a part of their family. It's, it's because they lost something. There's a sense of not remembering whatever that connectedness is. And what you mentioned before is that we are connected as individuals, in particular for African individuals of, of a community. And if you don't have that sense living in where you're currently living at, you get that loss. So as as a researcher, I want to do that research of looking at strengths and having, helping, and also in some form of way of recreating those oral histories of being raised in the community because um, that's a strength that has many non western families do have. The, the, the only thing I would say is that when we talk about strengths, to recognize that we're talking about strengths that are internal as well as external. And I think oftentimes when we talk about strength, we are really referring to external strengths. And so when we, so it's important when you, when you do your study to perhaps have some focus on internal strengths also, because that is what I was addressing tonight in terms of that part of ourselves that is seeking meaning and purpose and cohesiveness. It's like, I remember once um, I was told that there are four questions that every human being on this planet at some point needs to answer. And the first question is, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And how will I get there? And so those are the questions that direct one spirituality. So those are the, the inner strength questions. And whether we're aware of it or not, those are questions that we all answer every day of our lives. And so are the families and children that we interact with. So when we think about our involvement from that perspective, it takes on a different hue, I think. 
because they don't want anything any different than what we want. So, Robert, Dr. Hawkins said that was it for us. That was it. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to present Dr. Logan with this small (laughs) uh, token of our affection and a little memento of the Silver School of Social Work. Thank you so much for joining us. And may I present something? Uh, This is something that I'm presenting to the... Um, It's a a part of an oral history of 10 African-American women. And uh, some of these women you would recognize because they are uh, spouses of some of our national leaders. And, um, And what they did was, I interviewed them and they told their stories from earliest memory and including their careers, um, parenthood, marriage, and um, service. And they reflected on the civil rights movement and their involvement in it because they all had to be 60 years old before they were part of this project. And. Um, and then this little booklet is about the, I call it Living the Dream, and it is about the African American presence on, South, on the University of South Carolina campus. Oh, um, and that little booklet is an extension of a project, of, it's, I'm calling it a philanthropic project that I'm doing, um, and it's called the Dream Makers Project. And in that project, what we're doing is raising monies to provide scholarships for students of color in the rural areas of South Carolina. Uh, Because those are the students that tend to get left behind. So we want to focus on our brightest and our best. And uh, and I have some booklets outside if any of you are up to purchasing. But I'm I'm submitting this for your library and for your use. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.